I am a clinical pharmacist with Harris Health um, Hospital System, and um, today's lecture is going to be on asthma, so this is part of the respiratory um, section of pharmacotherapy for you guys, and I think later on we're going to talk about COPD and kind of some of the infections that have to do with the respiratory system, okay? So hopefully um, y'all learned some things today about asthma, and um, I would say pay attention to some of the questions that are going to be embedded into the PowerPoint today, because that would be very helpful when it comes to some of the test questions that y'all have on the respiratory exam, okay? Can you email us the PowerPoint? Oh, she still, it hasn't been posted yet still? Okay. Um, I'm going to see how I can email. Or AirDrop. Do you have an iPad? Um, this is on, it's on my laptop. Um, so give me one second. So I manage um, several front disease states, um, mainly diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and some anti-coag management. And also have patients that, of course, come to us that um, have asthma. So sometimes if the, uh, their PCP or the primary care provider would like for us to assist in managing their asthma, we also do that as well. Okay, so the objective of today's lecture is to um, discuss the etiology and epidemiology of asthma, lung anatomy, and basics of asthma physiology. We're also going to talk about the, how asthma is typically presented. Um, we're going to go over some of the diagnosis and severity of asthma, and also the basic approach to treating asthma. Um, we're going to dive in just a little bit into the management of acute exacerbation of asthma, and then lastly, um, kind of review how to use some of the inhalation agents as it relates to meditation therapy management for asthma. So these are some um, guidelines to kind of take note about regarding asthma management. So of course, as you know, as you all go out into the uh, pharmacy practice world, you all are going to be having to use evidence-based medicine to practice, right? And so it's going to be very important for you to familiarize yourself with a lot of the guidelines as it relates to disease-based management. So um, in 2007 was when um, most practitioners were introduced to like the the most recent guideline as it relates to the um, asthma management, and we call that the EP3 uh, or EPR3 guideline. So that was back in 2007, and then we didn't have any updates until 2020. So that was like all those years with no, no updates in terms of in terms of asthma treatment. So that just kind of shows you um, that most of the medications as it relates to asthma are pretty much the same, and it hasn't changed in a while. But um, GINA guidelines, which is our global initiative of asthma guidelines, that usually updates every year. So just something to note when you're looking out for um, most up-to-date guidelines. The GINA guidelines typically updates every year. The EPR3 guideline, the most recent one that we have, is the one from 2020. So um, uh, also a lot of times you'll see in the family practice that EPR3 guidelines are the guidelines that most of them tend to use. So that's why I'm going to um, go through both guidelines today. Some of them, they're similar, but you're going to see some of the differences in terms of how we treat patients based on their severity level and asthma therapy, okay? So what is asthma? Asthma is a heterogeneous disease characterized by chronic airway inflammation. It's usually defined by um, respiratory symptoms. The main one, um, or the telltale sign for asthma is wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and coughing. And it's usually defined as um, inflammation and bronchoconstriction. The difference here with asthma is that it's usually reversible, and that's reversible with medication. So the epidemiology of asthma is, um, so it's estimated to be in about 26.5 million people in the United States. So that's about eight and a half percent of our U.S. population. It is more common in women versus men when it comes to adults. Um, however, this is a prevalent children's disease. Um, so <clears throat> uh, the, the difference here in children is that it is more common in boys birth control whenever we're looking at children prevalence. And this is also a common disease that kind of hospitalizes a lot of our, our um, adolescents or children. Um, it does affect the minority disproportionately. 
Some major causes um, of disability can be found with asthma as well as healthcare use and poor quality of life. And so that's why it's very important to kind of make sure that we're managing those patients with asthma appropriately. So the etiology um, usually there are some risk factors associated with asthma. Uh, a lot of times it can be family history. There are some genetic components that can also be um, that can pre precede um, asthma. Um, I did post on here some of the triggers. So there are several triggering factors for asthma. Environmental drugs or chemicals. Um, there can be some conditions or events and also respiratory infections. So as you can see here in environmental, that can be animals such as cats, dogs, rodents, house dust, um, pollen, tobacco smoke, even secondhand smoke, um, drugs or chemicals. So this is going to be important especially for your patients um, when looking at some of the things that triggers them. Aspirin can be one of them, so your NSAIDs, as well as your non-selective beta blockers. Um, perfumes, seafood, shellfish, conditions such as allergic rhinitis, even exercising can also um, cause as a, tr a trigger, and panic attacks, even stress. Looking at respiratory infections, um, RSV, influenza, pneumonia, even the coronavirus, those can all be triggered or an asthma exacerbation, or asthma. So before we go into uh, the pathophysiology of asthma, I think it's important to kind of understand how the lung anatomy is. So the lung is um, usually broken down into two different systems, our conducting system and our exchange system. So starting with the trachea, the trachea, this area is um, what we call this your windpipe. So this is what conducts your inhaled air into the lungs, and then it goes into your bronchial, bronchial or your bronchi first. Um, that later then gets broken down to your bronchioles, and then later further gets broken down to your alveoli, which is basically what we call our air sac. That's essentially where gas exchanges are occurring. And also, this area is um, usually where the obstruction is occurring and um, what we typically see in terms of the asthma presentation. So first thing to note about asthma in general, there are four main changes that occur in asthma. One of them is muscle constriction. The other one is remodeling. So this is usually when you're having a hyper-responsiveness. Um, also mucus hypersecretion, and then airway edema, which is typically found when you're having a slight inflammation. So bronchial constriction, this is basically the contraction of your smooth muscles. Um, this contraction causes your airways to essentially narrow, and then in um, and this is usually in response to those irritants that I mentioned in my previous slides, right? So those environmental things, drugs, um, viral infections, and those type of um, triggers. So as you can see on the slide here where it says environmental <coughs> factors, so that um, triggers your dendritic cells. And that then causes a whole cascade of your TH2 and TH1 responses. And I'm pretty sure y'all have probably gone through this already in terms of the inflammation process. But once that inflammation process starts, you start having um, an increase in the release of your inflammatory mediator cells, right? So your histamines, your leukotrienes, cytokines, cytokines. So once that gets released, that's when you start seeing some of the constriction occurring and those symptoms that I was um, talking about in terms of <clears throat> presentation of asthma. This um, release is usually IgE-mediated, which is gonna be very important um, to know because some of the medications that start coming out later um, starts to really um, pinpoint those IgE um, receptors. Any questions so far? All right, so looking at diagnosis of asthma, whenever we're uh, diagnosing someone with asthma, we want to first look at their clinical presentation, right? So review the symptoms of asthma. We're making sure that um, the patient is having those, if they're presenting with wheezing, 
coughing, difficulty breathing. We also want to make sure that we're looking at a new cell history and their physical presentation. We want to see if this is something that is recent, because sometimes this can just be allergies, right? Um, is this something that they've had within the past four weeks, or is this something that they've been experiencing over the past 12 months? Lastly, in order for us to make a definitive diagnostic, diagnosis for someone with asthma, we have to perform spirometry. So spirometry is typically something that is done in an inpatient setting. Um, this is how we're able to basically establish if the patient has any type of airflow obstruction, and also this helps us to determine the reversibility of the patient's obstruction. So there are some, a lot of things here on this slide, but there are some important um, components that I wanted to highlight here. And these Three values are your FEV1, your FVC, and then your FEV1 SVC ratio. So your FVV1, as you can see, this is actually the volume of air that is um, the volume of air that is basically um, exhaled forcefully within your first second um, of actually taking out all of your air. The SVC is the maximum volume of air that can be exhaled after your full inspiration. So right after you take your first deep breath in, it's going to basically calculate how much volume of air that is. And then you have your FVV1, FVC ratio, and this is what we really use to differentiate whether or not someone has asthma or COPD. Okay? So, <clears throat> Spirometry, as I mentioned, this is a type of pulmonary function test. It's usually used to determine um, the respiratory symptoms, also the level of obstruction. Um, this is only done in an inpatient setting, so it's not something that a patient can just be in their home and just do like a spirometry test. And this typically takes anywhere between 15 to 45 minutes. So what's happening is, um, we're, like I said, we're establishing your airflow obstruction. During the um, spirometry test, we're basically measuring the FEV1, FEVT, and we measure this three times, okay? Then, after they do this three times, they give them a short-acting beta agonist. And once the short-acting beta agonist is given, they're seeing if their FEV1 improves by 12% or more. If it does improve by 12% or more, then we know for sure that that patient has asthma. If it does not improve, then most likely the patient probably has COPD because in that case, we're saying that it's not reversible, right? Okay. All right, so speaking of asthma and COPD, there are some key differentiation, uh, uh, differing factors between asthma and COPD. Of course, I'm not gonna go into greater detail, detail here because y'all are gonna have another lecture about COPD later. But <clears throat> some of the main features here is age of onset. So asthma, as I mentioned, is a common childhood disorder. Uh, disorder. So most of the patients that may come um, that have asthma are usually before the age of 20. COPD typically is presented in those that are over the age of 40. Some of the patterns of symptoms <clears throat> is that with asthma, it usually occurs over minutes, hours, days, versus COPD is uh, symptoms that are very persistent. Um, the symptoms are also uh, worse at nighttime or early in the morning for asthma. And then those who do have cough, it tends to be more non-productive versus someone who has COPD, which tends to present as a productive cough. Lung function, um, as I've already mentioned before, you'll see the difference between that in terms of the, their reversibility um, in their FEV1. And then past history or family history, usually asthma is triggered um, by allergies, environmental triggers, family history, obesity triggers. Versus COPD, there's usually a more heavy exposure to risk factors such as tobacco smoking. Um, exacerbation can typically occur with asthma versus um, COPD, which you can see that is actually more common for COPD exacerbation to occur. Um, airway inflammation is usually um, seen with eosinophils and or neutrophils. And then um, COPD is usually seen more of those students that I was talking about. So that's why coughing is more productive whenever you're looking at someone who's presenting with asthma versus COPD. All right, first question here. All of, all of these are typical symptoms of asthma except for so it's either C. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, please. So, as I mentioned, the, the reason why I put this here is because it's important for you to know your main features of asthma um, presentation in terms of symptoms. So, cough, wheezing, um, not immediate hallucination, but shortness of breath is also another one. So, I'm going to get to that question. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that there are going to be questions sprinkled throughout the presentation. So, pay attention to those questions as it relates to asthma, um, because that may help you on your test. Okay, let's just say that. So, treatment goals. Some of the goals of treatment here is to achieve good symptom control, minimize future risk of asthma-related mortality, minimize exacerbation, minimize persistent airflow limitations, and also minimize the side effects of your medication treatment. So um, when, when treating someone with asthma, before actually going into medication therapy management, we want to first assess their severity of asthma, because that's going to be important for us to know kind of which step we're going to go towards and which medication we're going to start them off with if, we're, if in fact, we're going to start them with medication therapy. Again, as I mentioned, asthma is mainly common in like children. Um, not to say that it cannot be presented in adults, and so a lot of times we also have to partner with their care provider in order for us to kind of um, identify things that are in their environment that may be triggering their um, asthma symptoms. And so once that is identified, if that's something that we can actually control, then we definitely want to make sure that that is maximized first in terms of non-pharmacological treatment options. Um, to eliminate whatever type of triggers that the patient may be having. And of course, if that's something that is still persistent in terms of symptoms, and then we start looking at medication therapy. So I talked about classification. Um, so these are the four main classifications when it comes to asthma. There's intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, and then severe persistent. Um, I did want to highlight here that, again, I mentioned that we have the GINA and the EPR3 guidelines, right? Um, but the GINA guidelines actually do not classify intermittent when it comes to asthma classification, but I still kept it here for completion's sake, so that way you are familiar with all four classifications of asthma therapy. Um, are y'all three guidelines, so it has intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, and severe persistent. So these are for all age groups, ages greater than 12, 5 through 11, and 0 to 4. I'm going to mainly focus on ages greater than, uh, greater than ages of 12, but I did keep the rest of the ages here for completion of state. Um, so there's <clears throat> different components that you're looking at whenever we're trying to determine the severity, uh, or whenever we're trying to determine their um, stages of their asthma. So one of them is nighttime awakening. So as you can see in intermittent, these patients are waking up less than two or, or two or less days a week versus mild persistent is more than two days a week. And then moderate persistence is happening daily. And then for those that are severe, this is something that's occurring throughout the day. In terms of use of a short acting beta um, agonist, Usually for those who are intermittent, they're not using it as often. This is less than or um, equal to two days a week, so similar to how often that they're waking up at night. And then um, in terms of <clears throat> mouth persistent, this is more than two days a week, moderate daily, and then severe persistent is usually several times throughout the day. Um, going into your uh, interference with normal activity, so Again, it just depends on, like, if you're intermediate or severe, the more limitations you're having, the more persistent or severe that we consider your asthma to be. Um, now, FEV1, FEC, remember I told you that's something we looked at when we were doing the chronic test. So, typically, it's pretty normal when we're looking at those with intermediate to, intermittent to mild, mild persistence. Once we get into moderate and severe persistence, you start seeing a significant reduction in terms of that FEV1, FEV2 score. Um, same goes with the FEV1. As you can see, as you go toward intermittent to severe persistence, the percentage of that lessens. Okay. 
All right, so y'all memorized this already? Mm -hmm. <laughs> y'all got it? Sure. Okay, y'all sure? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, good. Hopefully y'all memorized it because this next question is going to be related to that slide. So there's a 23-year-old female, okay, so this patient is greater than or equal to 12, who has been coughing and wheezing about twice weekly, and she wakes up at night about three times per month. She has never been given a diagnosis of asthma, and she has not been to a physician in years. She uses an old albuterol inhaler, but recently ran out, so she is seeking care. Her activities are not limited by symptoms. A spirometry is done, and um, the female's FEV1 is 82% of predicted. So, based off of the EPR3 guidelines, which of the which of this um, best fits your classification of asthma? Moderate. In terms. Moderate. 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 Mild and I said moderate. So yes, that's what y'all are thinking. So so here's the thing. We're gonna go back and look at this patient here. Yes. Yes. So, so we said that the patient is having coughing and wheezing about twice a week, right? Yes. Oh two at twice week. Okay. So this okay, twice a week. Mild and that puts her where? Mild. That puts her here right now, right? Right. Okay. All right. And then we also said that she never um, been given a diagnosis, right? So that's good. And she has um, not been well, to a physician. Wait, hold on. Did I miss something? Yeah, three times per month. Three times, oh, three times per month. Three times per month. Okay, so she's waking up three times per month. So where's that? Three miles per month. That's here. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we know that she's having symptoms, mm -hmm. but she's waking three or four times per month. So what we do is, whichever one is the highest, that's what we go with. So she would be considered mild persistent. Mild persistent. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So even if she had like two from intermittent and she had one in severe, then she would automatically be Go to, okay. Okay. I don't have to memorize it, but just kind of know in general. But like I said, if you but you can actually put question. that chart on the exam if you want. Oh, we can? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Get with Dr. K for the Because some of them don't know how to do all this. Some of them don't know. Are they similar? They are. They are. They are. They are. Yeah. So, but I will tell you this on the next lecture, you're not going to be on the right. I'm just saying. But I will put it on the exam, but I'm just saying. But the good thing is, I mean, we're I don't, I haven't memorized this either, but I'm, I'm familiar with in terms of like, if there are more symptoms, it'll be obvious, right? If there's more symptoms um, of things, then you kind of have an idea of this intermediate, mild, or severe. Okay. All right, now going into pharmacotherapy. Um, this is our bread and butter, right? Like, so at home pharmacotherapy, we usually break them up into like three main categories. We have our rescuers, our controllers, and then our adjunct add-on therapy. <clears throat> so usually our rescuers are um, typically taken on an ad-needed basis. Um, these are your short-acting beta agonists, your steroids, um, sometimes your anticholinergics, and then I put on here low-dose IPS or formidol, so I can basically stands for an inhaler for steroids. And then you have your controllers, um, which are your inhaled steroids, your long-acting beta agonists, glucotriding modifying agents, geoxone, all of that, amalizumab, and then we're going to go into our biologics. So you may, um, I just want to mention, this isn't on the slide, but sometimes um, some people refer to these therapies as like SMART treatments or or MART. So Gina, I think, I mean, Gina guidelines, they refer to it as SMART therapy, and then the EPR3 guidelines refer to it as SMART therapy. So just something to kind of just uh, keep in mind, I guess, for future if you hear it as it relates to asthma treatment. Okay. So going 
going into our short-acting beta agonist. So how these work is that, that they selectively um, they selectively work on your beta two receptors um, in your your smooth muscles, the airways in your smooth muscles. So this is actually what leads to bronchodilation. That's important, right? Because remember I said with asthma, it's going to be a bronchoconstriction of our smooth muscles. So you want something that's going to be able to relax those smooth muscles. So. <clears throat> The thing about these medications, however, is that it does not affect inflammation. So I also, I did mention also that asthma is constriction and inflammation that is occurring. So you're only, um, most of the time with these short acting beta agonists, you're only gonna get a temporary relief because the inflammation process may be continuing, especially if you're having continuous constriction. So that's something to keep in mind with our short acting beta agonists. The short-acting um, short beta agonists or SABAs are also our drug of choice when it comes to exercise and use asthma. And um, just listed on here, uh, two of the main ones for your albuterol and levalbuterol. Um, there are several brands that you may see out there, so Pro-Air for benzoyl benzoin and then Dopinex um, for levalbuterol. The main difference um, here is that sometimes they come in different formulations, so you may see albuterol as a nebulizer, some as an MDI, uh, HFA. So those we'll go into later in terms of the difference between them, but they all, um, all pretty much carry like the same ingredients, either albuterol or legal albuterol. All right, some of the um, adverse effects that can happen here is that you can have increased heart rate, um, you can also have some very quick decrease in your oxygen level. Ketoacidosis could potentially occur too, which can be important for those who have diabetes. Um, hypokalemia and arrhythmia, fine tremors, appetite, it can be an appetite suppression. Headache, nausea, and sleep, disturb sleep disturbances can also occur with these medications. Um, something to also note, especially with our short acting beta agonists, is that you can actually lose the effect of the medication when you're using it for an extended period of time. So that's why we're, this is only for as needed because we do not try to encourage short acting beta agonists as a long term medicine for you to be using every day because you can end up um, losing the effect of it. Um, and then uh, it just mentioned that clock two it can plateau um, within one week before the right therapy. So if you're using it every day for one week or three four times a day every week can, can be used for plateau effect. Um, uh, Gastric relaxes is also, uh, again, like I said, with increased heart rate can be seen with SABAS. Um, however, it can resolve on its own after uh, stopping therapy for about three days. Next, we have our inhaled corticosteroids. So um, these are more longer acting than their short acting beta agonists. They usually reduce the inflammatory responses that are happening when it comes to asthma. They also can um, induce vasoconstriction. Um, however, this is this basically leads to the mucosal blood flow um, and the swelling discomfort, like reducing all of that from happening. And then um, it produces a local immune responsive state. So basically, we're limiting the lung's hypersensitive reaction. One thing to note about these inhaled corticosteroids is that it usually takes about a week or two to see the maximal benefit. So a lot of times, some patients they start on these steroids and they're like, "I'm not getting any relief." So it's important to kind of know this, so that way you you can counsel them accordingly in terms of it may take a week or two in order for these to actually start seeing the effect. This is a preferred long-term agent in pregnancy. I think it's mainly the BDS and I um, inhale for steroids that they typically use in the patient population. Um, but it is preferred as a both reliever and a controller, only when used with formiterol. So I did want to mention that ICS when used with formiterol is preferred reliever and controller per both the GINA guidelines and NH um, or EPR3 guidelines. Um, but it's not FDA approved as an inhaler. It's just on both guidelines, but just something to note out there if that ends up as a question on the new question or something. 
All right. Inhale corticosteroids. So these are our common brands of inhale corticosteroids. It also has listed there your low dose, medium dose, and high doses. Um, now, this is not a table of equivalents, okay, but these are just suggested total daily doses for low, medium, and high for these steroids, for these um, inhale corticosteroids. <clears throat> And then I don't know if y'all know some common commonalities in terms of what they usually end with, the O and the E. So that would be you know. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm sorry, so can you go back? Can you go back to the slide before? So it says it induces vasoconstriction. Mm -hmm. I thought we were trying to dilate. So remember, we, we were talking about bronchoconstriction when it comes to the, the small fluid. Okay, wait, let me first hear the question that you asked before I answer what I think you were trying no, to No, go ahead, go ahead. So bronchoconstriction, we're talking about the small airways and the muscles within our airways, right? So those are those are constriction, or constricting in terms of how the prevention is happening. Then we also have um, vasodilation that's occurring, which, um, when vasodilation occurs, that's when you start seeing a lot of the mucus, blood flows, um, swelling, discomfort, and you want to prevent that from happening. So the corticosteroids is basically helping to induce vasoconstriction, constriction, so that way we can um, reduce the mucosal blood flow. So that's to help with the inflammation as yeah. opposed to increasing the airway breathing. Right. In the so there's, okay. So there's two different things happening. We have bronchial constriction and then we have vasodilation, which is also happening because of the inflammation that's occurring. So when we're talking when we're looking at steroids, it has a lot there's several mechanisms of action with steroids, but the main thing I think that's important to note with the steroids is that we're essentially trying to reduce the inflammation the inflammatory process that is happening in asthma. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any questions on this slide? All right, now, um, corticosteroids, <clears throat> um, one thing that's very important to note is that it can cause what we call brush. Um, essentially, it's like fungus that can be growing in your tongue. So whenever patients are on these medications, we always make sure that we counsel them to wash and rinse their mouth out. Um, um, after each use of using an inhaled corticoid steroid. All right. Um, so the next one here is our long-acting beta agonist. Um, so usually when it comes to asthma management, long-acting beta agonists are never used alone. They're always used in combination with an inhaled corticoid steroid. Um, this increases the efficacy of not only the um, inhaled corticoid steroid, but um, by adding this, we're able to get the benefit of that bronco. Um, the, whoo, you're able to get the benefit of relaxing your bronco sneeze muscles, right? And then also the benefit of having a reduction in inflammation. So that's why those are pretty good to be used in combination. Um, the reason why we also do not use lavas alone, especially when it comes to asthma treatment, is because the risk of asthma-related death is, is very common, especially whenever using lavas um, for asthma, asthma treatment. So this is important to note, because whenever you start doing treatment for COPD, it might be a little bit different. So this is related only to asthma, okay? So whenever you see that on the test, and you see a lava by itself, for asthma treatment that is incorrect. Okay. All right. Um, so these are a list of some of our common brands for um, lava in combination with an inhaled corticoid steroids. So you have your Simicort, which is essentially budesonide and Fomenerol, which I'm pretty sure a lot of people have probably seen this on the pharmacy. They also have Rio Lipta, Advair Discus, um, add their HFA and Lunera. So <clears throat> on here, 
Um, I would say probably familiarize yourself with this line of work. There may be a question or two just related to like the listening combination of these medications. Um, so Simbacord has Tramerol and Budesonide. Rio Elipta has Bustazone with uh, Benisterol. And then Adrenaliscus has the Bustazone in combination with Zomiterol. And then Dulera uh, is Bometazone in combination with Bometerol. Your class here is your luchatrine modifying agents. These basically antagonizes are type. Okay, these basically um, antagonizes are type three muscarinic receptors in your bronchial smooth muscles. Again, resulting in relaxations of those muscles and the airways. So um, when mamas are used, it's usually in addition to your inhaled corticosteroids, um, or it can be used with the lava slash inhaled corticosteroids, usually whenever they're active and not well controlled. So um, some of the medications in these drug classes are your triatropium bromide, so Spiriva, also um, hypertropium bromide, which is actually a short-acting um, muscarinic antagonist. Um, these are actually only used as an alternative rescue therapy in asthma exacerbation in patients who are not able to tolerate a beta agonist. So it's safe. Remember I said for short-acting beta agonists, those are medications that we can use for exercise-induced um, asthma or like um, patients who have like an acute exacerbation. Um, if they're not able to tolerate that, then this can serve as an alternative. Then we have a uh, trilogy, which is actually a combination of, um, oops, sorry. Okay, which is actually um, a combination of inhaled corticosteroids, long acting beta antagonists, and your muscarinic antagonists. And also, I wanted to mention here when looking at Spiriva, Spiriva. It takes a long time for you to start seeing um, the effects. It takes about four to eight weeks. All right. Um, Lucatrion modifying agents. So there are two distinct classes of our Lucatrion modifying agents. Um, you have your Lucatrion receptor antagonists, RRL, um, LCRAs, and then you have your 5 lipoxygenase um, inhibitors. Essentially, these selectively block your Lucatrion receptors uh, to counter the respiratory inflammation. So um, they both interfere with the pathways that essentially allows for your mast cells, eosinophils, basophils um, to release those Lucatrion mediators. Um, so basically reducing your symptoms that are associated with like the inflammatory process of asthma. In terms of place and therapy, um, these are usually in patients with mild asthma. It may be used as an alternative first-line control of therapy in those who cannot take an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, and then this can also be used in patients with moderate to severe asthma. It can also be used, again, as an adjunct controller therapy in those with inadequate symptoms to um, control with their inhaled corticosteroid. And lastly, um, this can also be used as a pretreatment of exercise-induced bronchospasm. So this is an agent that can be used for exercise-induced bronchospasm. So these are our agents here. Um, Montelukast or Zingular, um, Acolate, and then we also have Zalutin. Um, there is an FDA box warning for Montelukast and that it can cause serious risk of developing neuropsychic effects. Um, but behavioral changes are actually common in like all of these agents. It's just 
so happens to be that Monthly Weakness has an actual SBA box warning. So I did mention here, uh, I did put on here also the dosing for children. Um, Um, because this is also a common agent that is used in adolescents or pediatrics. So you want us to know the dose? <laughs> For this slide. All right, mast cell stabilizers. So these are also part of our controllers. They do have dual mechanism of action as well. Um, they inhibit the release of mediators such as histamine, glucotrienes um, from mast cells, and then also inhibits the chloride channel activation. So in terms of place of therapy with these medications, they, these can be used as alternate um, initial control of therapy in mild persistent asthma, and this also can be used as a pre-treatment for exercise induced bronchial constriction. Um, there are, these are the med this is the medication. It's chromium sodium. Um, whenever we're, if someone is going to go exercise or they're using it for exercise, then we usually tell them to, to take it 10 minutes prior to exposure or 10 minutes prior to exercise. It does also come um, as a nebulizer. Well, it comes as a nebulizer. Um, one thing to note here is that the pediatric dosing for this is actually the same for adult dosing, so you don't have to think in terms of like, is the dose different? It's the same. Adverse effects, headaches, and diarrhea. Um, if someone is having to need to be off of the medication, then it does have to be tapered. All right, our xanthine. Has anyone heard of theophylline before? Yeah? Does anyone know anybody on Theophilin? No, I didn't think so. Who said they used it? I said nobody Oh, <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Okay, so yeah, so Theophilin, I mean, has definitely fallen way out of favor. Uh, way out of favor. But I actually, in my lifetime, only had one patient that was on Theophilin, which I was trying to keep pushing on this. But it was a new patient that came to me. But I put this here for completion's sake because I mean, it's still there. So um, it helps basically to relax your smooth muscle. Um, it suppresses the responses of airways to stimuli. And it also inhibits um, two of your enzymes, your PDE3 and your PDE4. So this is um, used usually as an alternative therapy um, to inhale corticoid steroids for patients who have mild persistent asthma. Mild persistent some of the adverse effects is that you may have, uh, like you feel like your, your heart rate is moving really fast. It has like a lot of tapping like adverse effects. Um, it does also have a lot of toxic, toxic symptoms. So you can experience persistent um, vomiting, cardiac arrhythmia, and then also um, seizures. It has a very low um, therapeutic index. So a lot of times when patients are on this medication, it does require a lot of monitoring um, in order for them to make sure that it's within that therapeutic index. Um, again, like I mentioned, these are some of like the main um, side effects, like clinical side effects that can happen. And then also in terms of labs, um, patients can experience low calcium level, uh, I'm sorry, high calcium, High calcium level, low potassium level, or, and or um, metabolic acidosis with respiratory um, output. So, output. Okay. And then it does have a lot of, well, not a lot, but it has some drug drug interactions. As you can see there, one of the drug interactions is even with Zyrusin, which is one of the medications that we use for asthma therapy. Okay, moving on to the biological medications, because I think this is kind of like the wave, like where a lot of uh, treatment options in terms of lots of chronic disease state management is going. So there are um, 
the myelogic pair or monoclonal antibodies, um, including your anti-IgE, anti-IL-5 or NCK5, anti-NCK5 receptor blockers, anti-NCK4 receptor blockers. Um, so there are like six agents right now, or five agents right now for asthma, um, <coughs> which all basically are like injections. So you know, we were talking earlier about just mainly medications that are used for inhalation and medications that you can feel by mouth. So now we're just using medication agents that you actually have to inject to get um, asthma relief. Are so any of these medications on your formula? Would you buy a lot? Uh, right now, you fix it because it's being used for other disease states outside of asthma. Um, but they're, of course, expensive. So they're like on formulary, but they require non formulary requests. Like, yeah. But you fix it in one of them because it has a lot of other benefits to it um, that I'm aware of. So, anti IgE, Zolaire, um, so this basically inhibits the binding of IgE to your mast cells and basal cells. Um, again, this is given subcutaneously. Um, and the dosing of this is based off of your body, your body weight. So I didn't put the natural dosing on there, but um, usually a minimum of three to six months of treatment is suggested, is suggested in order to determine its efficacy. Um, it does have, of course, some side effects. Some nasal pharyngitis, headaches, a horse respiratory infection, and sinus, uh, sinus, sinus inflammation. Box warning is that it can cause anaphylaxis. So that's something to take into consideration um, when someone is on this medication. And then you fix it, usually it, or it inhibits the interleukin 4 and interleukin 3. Um, although we're not sure, kind of like, how that helps specifically in asthma, but we've seen that it helps patients who do have asthma. Um, so like I said, dupixin is one of those medications that has actually been used for several other disease states. So you might notice this medication when you go through your other pharmacotherapy disease state lectures. Again, um, just like uh, our Zolaire, it takes a while before you start seeing the maximum benefits. So Zolaire, we said, take about three to six months, and you fix it, you won't see the uh, maximum benefit until like about four months of using therapy. Okay, now moving on to uh, Nucola. So this also is another biologic agent. It reduces eosinophil numbers in the sputum and the blood. Um, this is usually dosed every four weeks. And then, um, again, it takes about four months in order for you to start seeing the maximum effects here. Facenera is um, also another agent that takes a while for you to start seeing the full effect. Usually it starts off with about 30, 30 milligrams um, every four weeks for the first three doses, and then once every eight weeks. Lastly is your Zincare. So this is um, dose three milligrams per kg once every four weeks. Um, it actually does not have a max dose. Um, so it is used a minimum again of four months of treatment um, in order for you to see an actual effect. And the um, thing about this one, so I think the other two that I mentioned before, those are sub, sub two, this is actually given IV. As an IV infusion. Um, this is just kind of like a summary of all of the biologics. So if you want to like use this as reference, all of the information is also on here too. Any questions so far? Okay, so if y'all don't have any questions, I got a question. <laughs> Which of the following drug class choice? Um, can be used for exercise or used for C. 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 Yeah, so yes, the correct 
ethnic or should we be Singapore? Um, so Dulera MDI is Momentum Zone and Cure, um, or Momentum Zone and Fomenteral, right? Mm -hmm. And then Rio Elixir is a combination of what? Mexican Zone and, yep, mm -hmm. And then Asmir is a combination of what? Okay, what is the appropriate dose of monthly gas in patients age 15 and older with asthma? Yeah, good job, 10 milligrams. So remember, 5 milligrams were for patients who were 16 to 14 years of age, and then 4 milligrams were for patients who were like 1 to 2 years of age, and this does not come in 4 milligrams. So. What is the appropriate dose? So how old are 5 milligrams of each? Um, 5 milligrams are, I think, 16 to 14 years of age. Okay, should be on that chart there. Okay, how long does a patient need to take Cereza before achieving a maximum Four to four to eight. Yep, the correct answer is D. So it usually takes about four to eight weeks in order for someone to actually start seeing maximum benefit from using Cereza. So the reason I put this question here is because I have a lot of patients that send me on Cereza. Well, I don't really have a lot, but I have like a good handful. But um, it's good to know like how long it usually takes for patients to get an effective medication. So that way when they're coming to you and they've only been on it for like a week or two, you can kind of use that as an opportunity Okay, Theophylline, our favorite drug. The use of this is limited by which of the following? A need to constantly monitor blood concentration, narrow therapeutic index, numerous drug drug interactions, or all of the above. Step 
justify the need to start adding on your llama uh, or consider having a higher dose of that ICS with Prometerol. So as you can see, you don't see short acting beta agonists out there, do you? No, so that's something to just take into consideration when looking at the GINA guidelines in comparison to your EQR3 guidelines. Okay, so this is the EPR3 guidelines, also known as the 2020 focus updates. So for step one, you see there it has PRN and SABA. Those are usually the patients that we define as intermittent asthma. So remember, GINA guidelines does not have intermittent asthma as part of their um, classification of asthma. Um, and then step two you, is when they start uh, saying that the patient can use a low dose inhaled corticosteroid um, as needed. And then uh, step three is when you can use it as a um, actual daily low dose of corticosteroid with prometerol. Step four increases to medium dose. Step five is when you can add on that llama. And then step six increasing it to a high dose. Right now I'm just focusing on ages 12 and above, but you can see there are those for patients five to 11 and zero to four of age. So basically, this is the same thing, straight from the guidelines. <coughs> and then this table here, I kind of just put this together as a summary of like the GINA guidelines and EPR3 together. So you can kind of see what I was talking about here. So step one, you have intermittent um, for the EPR3 guidelines, it has to stop a PRN. But then if you're um, looking at the GINA guidelines, it's recommending a low dose inhaled corticosteroid. So those are the differences here when looking at step one in terms of quick release. Then going into step two, um, in terms of controller for um, EP3 and GINA guidelines, uh, where am I looking at? Oh. Oh, okay, there's no, there's no preferred controller because remember we're still using a low dose inhaled corticosteroid for mineral, PRN when we're looking at step one and step two. And then step three, for moderate persistence, we're starting to use our daily um, ICS system for mineral, and then you're also still using your low dose maintenance ICS for mineral when, you look, when we're looking at our GINA guidelines and then so forth and so forth. So basically, as you go down in steps, you're either increasing that uh, intensity of your inhaled corticosteroids or adding a lot. All right, so once you start treatment, you wanna assess how well the treatment is working, right? So we usually define that as either being well controlled, not well controlled, or very poorly controlled. So once the patient is coming back to you after being on therapy for um, however uh, long that you've been sending them to come back and they come back to follow up with you, you want to assess to see how their symptoms are doing, nighttime awakenings, um, how it's interfering with their daily activities. So essentially the same components that we looked at in the beginning in terms of classifying their asthma is what you're essentially looking at again to see how well controlled their asthma is after they started therapy. Okay, looking at management of asthma exacerbation, so mainly in primary care, because I don't work in the inpatient setting, but um, usually once the patient um, is coming to you in the outpatient setting, you're assessing the severity um, of their asthma um, while starting also a short acting beta agonist and oxygen. So those are the two things that you have to start if they're coming into you and you're starting to notice that they're having um, exacerbation. So you want to consider um, alternate uh, causes of their acute breathlessness. So this can also be um, an area where you start looking at differentials, right? Because the symptoms can present similarly to someone who may be having um, heart failure or someone who has pulmonary anemia. So you want to make sure that you're ruling those things out before you're actually treating them for an asthma exacerbation. So once that's determined, you determine if it's mild, moderate, severe, or if it's life-threatening. Of course, if it's life-threatening, it will be transferred to a acute care center. Um, if it's severe, the same. 
Um, however, if it's in between mild and moderate, you can actually start them with treatment, and the treatment options are shown there on the far left hand side. And then, um, but they do have to be monitored for an hour, so they have to stay in the clinic for about an hour of monitoring to make sure that they're stable before you they're discharged and um, starting them back on their new therapy. Um, so corticoid steroids, the steroids is part of the <coughs> For asthma exacerbation. So, this is a comparison of the uh, systemic, systemic uh, corticosteroid preparations. Um, so, the, again, this is usually used in treatment of severe acute exacerbation. Um, usually, we don't see the main effect um, like immediately within three to four to six hours. And um, when someone is using it as an outpatient, uh, we try to have them not be on it for more than seven days. Has anybody seen this before? Or knows anybody who's used this before? A peak exploratory flow machine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody know what it's used for? Mm -hmm. maximum speed of expiration while they're sitting up. So basically when, when the patient, um, this also helps us to kind of understand like the level of how well or not well that they're breathing. Um, but you have the patient essentially sit up straight, you tell them to take a deep breath, and then they have to tightly seal their mouth around the mouthpiece of that device. And you ask them to exhale as hard and as fast as they can. And they have to do that three times. So imagine telling that to somebody who's already going through like trouble breathing and you're like, okay, well I need, I need you to like breathe into this tube and see like how hard and how fast you're able to breathe. But it's necessary for us to kind of know how um, their breathing is. And it's also a good practice for someone who does have, have asthma so they can kind of know what their normal breathing is. But we usually ask them to do that three times and then take their first there, um, of the three times, they're supposed to take their best of those three readings. And um, basically, we use this to kind of help to determine what zone they're on. So there's a green zone, yellow zone, and a red zone. Um, and this helps you to also develop your asthma treatment plan. So if a patient is using the peak flow meter and they see that they're at more than 80% of their personal best and they're not having any, any symptoms, then of course they can continue with their current regimen that they're using for asthma. But if, we, if they're using it and they're between 50 to 80% of their personal best and we consider them to be in the yellow zone, so as healthcare providers, we're able to kind of determine whether or not that, that they would need um, medication management. But in home, the patient can actually um, make their own adjustments in terms of their quick release medication. So if they were on um, a short acting beta agonist, then they could do two or four cups every 20 minutes um, for one hour, and then they would have to go back and repeat this again just to see if they're able to get any, if they were able to get released. Um, and then, of course, if they're in the red zone, that means it's less than 50% of their predicted best, and you ask them at that point they need to go to the ED or CT or to see care immediately. Um, so, I mentioned some percentages on there, and you're probably like wondering like where am I getting these percentages from, or how people are able to determine these percentages. So on that peak flow meter, as you can see, it has like numbers on here, right? So um, each, there's most of the peak flow meters, they usually come with a chart, and it's determined based off your age, uh, your gender, and uh, like your, not your age, your race, and, um, did I say height and height? And then that will tell you kind of like what a normal peak would be for someone in your category. And then you would um, essentially, be able, how you're able to um, calculate this is that you take your normal peak flow and you divide that by your personal best. And then that will determine kind of like what your percentage is. 
I'm going to do an exercise so you can see what I'm talking about. So you have a patient um, using their peak flow meter and wants to know her peak flow percentage and what zone she falls under, given her personal best is 300. However, a normal peak flow is 250, right? So based off of all, like, on the chart. There, there'll be a chart. The, the reason why I say it's because each peak flow comes with their own chart. So I can't, like, put, a, put one in here because sometimes they do things different. I don't know why. I think it's because of the peak flow that the patient gives. But anyways, they have a, the, her normal peak flow is 250. However, when she was breathing, she took, checked it three times and her personal best was 300. So now we need to see what percentage she is and that will help us to determine what zone. So with that being said, I told y'all the calculation, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody should have got an answer. C. C? Okay, I need to get C. Who said that? Of your budget. That is correct. So that puts her at 83%. So if she's at 83%, that puts her in the green zone. So that means she's doing pretty good. What's the, what's the formula? So it's essentially um, your uh, essentially it's your normal peak flow divided by your personal best, and then you multiply that number by 100. Um, but put it in your notes. <laughs> so your normal peak flow divided by your personal best and you multiply that by 100. Leisure. 
here, they are also there. So usually for MDI, I probably want to counsel them to use it in southern to make sure that they basically shake it very well before it leaves. They're also supposed to um, prime the inhaler before they use it. Um, so essentially what you're doing is you're spraying it into the air like three times before you actually put it into your uh, mouth. And then um, the patient should also breathe all the air out of their lungs completely. So you make sure you expel all your air and then you put the mouthpiece that was into your mouth and you start to actually press down onto the canister and you're breathing in slowly. Okay. Um, it should, um, usually that's for about 10 seconds. And um, then if you want to do another puff, then we usually tell people to wait at least one month, one minute between each puff. So the key thing to note here is that when you're breathing with an MBI, it's slow. Okay, so MBI slow. So um, one of the things that has been developed to kind of assist with people who may have difficulty in coordinating their breathing or um, is a holding chamber. So a lot of times we see this, especially with our pediatric patients, you can put a face finger on, and attach it directly onto the MBI, so that way they are able to uh, get all the air, uh, all the medications that is needed whenever they're breathing. So literally, you can just tell them to like sing "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star," so that way you're like having them open their mouth since they're not able to like breathe the way that they're supposed to, so they can get some of the air into, uh, I mean, the medication into their mouth during the time that you're actually activating, activating the, um, the medication. Excuse me. Can you repeat that statement in a later dose of the inhaler? Did you say, uh, I mean, about the flow in a... About the what? About the flow. The flow? Mm -hmm. um, like in terms of it, like it needs to be slow. Oh. So basically, you press down, and you're breathing in slowly for 10 seconds, okay. the medication. And make sure that the mouthpiece is attached directly into their mouth. So before you breathe in, you're exhaling out all your air, and then you put the mouthpiece onto your mouth, you push down, and you're breathing in slowly for 10 seconds. So. Now going into our dry powder inhalers, um, these deliver drugs in a powder form. It's a dry powder, so it doesn't contain any like gases. Um, so the main difference between these inhalers and your MBIs that I mentioned before are, is that these rely on a more force, forceful inhalation from the patient. So um, the, the disadvantage of this though is because as you can see the way it's Design, you can't put the spacer on there. So like those patients that I was telling you that may not be able to like breathe, um, have like proper breathing coordination, so like our pediatric patients, you can't put a spacer on these type of agents for them to get the medication. Um, so this may not be beneficial for those patients. Um, one thing to note is that they also sometimes contain lactose, so that's something to maybe take into consideration for our diabetic patients or patients who may be sensitive to sugar. It is um, portable, it's um, easy to use, and um, I guess you don't really need like hand mouth coordination. So again, this is also another video. But like I said, I think trauma in the process we should have like a little. Um, but for these type of um, inhalers, um, it's good to counsel your patient that once they take it out of the oil or they open it, I think it's only good for like a month. So unlike you know your other inhalers, like your short acting with the agonist inhalers sometimes, or like your interface, uh, MBIs, I'm sorry, those I think you can keep a little bit longer. Um, so essentially, um, I don't know what the quote for you to know here. 
about this compared to your MBI. Remember I said the MBI, you have to shake it well before you use it. So for these agents, you do not shake before you use it. For these agents, you have to breathe in fast and forcefully. Um, here. LT is a 14-year-old male adolescent with moderate to severe asthma. He was recently initiated on fluticasone, clomidogrel, dry powder inhaler, 100 um, slash 50 micrograms per inhalation, one puff twice daily, and then albuterol, one or two puffs every four to six hours as needed. Today, LT's two-week follow-up in the clinic um, has a two-week follow-up in the clinic, and he has nighttime awakening two or three times per week, and then you recognize that LT has been taking fluticasone, some mineral regularly, but has not been using his inhaler correctly. So y'all remember what fluticasone, some mineral is? So it's a dry powder inhaler. The fluticasone, some mineral is a dry powder inhaler, okay? So which of the following is a correct educational point to give LT regarding the fluticasone, somidorol, dry powder inhaler? A, prime the inhaler before each use. B, inhale with a forceful breath to activate the device. C, use a spacer with the inhaler to improve coordination of breath and dose. Or D, shake the inhaler before use. B, B. What did I hear? B, B. B, as in more? Oh, you had a question on this? Yeah. Was A and B? Oh, you know what? Trick question. So, actually, and I forgot to mention, I was like, I knew there was something I was missing. So, you don't actually need to find. Well, I know it's in the first dose. The first line. Well, I guess you can. But most people, well, hold on. Let me, let me take a step back. Let me take a step back. So, technically, you don't need to prime a DPI. Because what you're, how you're activating it is with that forceful, fast, the forceful, fast breath on your first inhalation. So you don't need to prime a DPI, but your, for your MBIs, your needle dose inhalers, you do have to prime the, the MBI before you. So that's a one, two, three of the air before you actually inhale it. Your DPI is going to be, it looks almost like a hamburger. You're putting it into your mouth like this, and you're doing very fast. So there's no way to kind of like push the drug out before you use it. Does that mean you would be wasting it, right? Not necessarily wasting, but just the way the device power of it is There's no way to like, because it's a gas, right? So I wish I brought my, my device with me and I left it in the study, so I do apologize. But hopefully when you see the videos, you'll see what I'm talking about. So A, C, and D actually go 
able to meet your MDI and, and B is for your DPI. Does anyone have any other questions? No? Okay. So, basically, in conclusion, asthma is a chronic condition that requires proper management. Pharmacists will play a critical role in helping patients manage their, manage their asthma effectively. So, it's going to be very important to kind of um, educate our patients, especially on counseling them on how to use their medications, how long it takes for the medication. Um, and yeah, collaborating with the with other healthcare professionals in order for us to manage their asthma accordingly. With that being said, I'll open the floor for any questions that anyone may have, or if y'all need to go back to another slide.